All right. Well, thank you. Um, so I'm going to give you a uh, very brief overview of the, the executive uh, functions, which is probably a good way to start because uh, the executive functions are really, you know, are all about organizing and planning. Probably sets a good, uh, good template for the rest of our uh, discussion this morning. So what are these executive functions? You know, if I, if I asked you what is language, what is memory, I think most of us would have, you know, a pretty intuitive uh, sense, a pretty intuitive understanding of, you know, what we're talking about. But these executive functions, I mean, what exactly is that? Um, basically, you know, it, it's a set of processes. And as we talk, you'll find out that it's not really a, a specific place in the brain that I can point to or anything like that, but it really is this whole set of, of processes that are needed to help and guide and direct our behavior. Um, they're particularly important in terms of helping us plan for the future and engage in problem solving, all those aspects that are rarely really important to us in terms of functioning in our day-to-day -day lives. So I, I mentioned before that you know going first to talk about uh, executive functions is important because it, it, it's all about organization. And that, I think, is, is going to be a key term for us. This is what we do with the executive skills. When we talk about executive functions, we really are talking about higher order cognitive ability. This is all about abstract reasoning, thinking about the future, um, being able to plan to meet contingencies, but also to be able to change our behavior to meet different uh, conditions that might arise or to modify what we do. As a as a psychologist, a neuropsychologist, when we evaluate uh, executive functions in uh, children and teenagers, and certainly in adults as well, uh, typically we look at several different factors. And we're going to go through some of those basics uh, right now. And I got this straight out of the uh, manual for one of the uh, measures that we use. So we talk about all these different concepts. Uh, inhibition. The brain spends a lot of time keeping us from doing things. But in terms of behavior, being able to inhibit our impulses is, is incredibly important. Think about your children sitting in school, being able to inhibit the impulse to get up and squirm and move around, that kind of thing. So inhibition is incredibly important. But also being able to shift, having flexibility in our thinking processes, being able to shift attention when needed. Uh, again, thinking about a child in the classroom, you know, you have to be able to, to focus and pay attention look at the board, but you might also have to be able to shift that attention. Sorry about that. See, I have to use my executive skills and get back to uh, modify my behavior and stay here behind the podium. Um, so uh, another concept that's part of the executive functions is this whole sense of emotional control. Think about that for a minute, emotional control. So being able to manage our feelings and particularly as that affects our behavior, but also how that affects how we process other information. So when we deal with frustration, for example, uh, learning how to manage that or having the brain structures needed to help us in, uh, inhibit those kind of emotional impulses where we might get very frustrated. Uh, this morning I had a great example of that. You should have been in my house. I was trying to save this talk to a flash drive early in the morning with only half a cup of coffee. So. Um, with that emotional control, my computer would not be sitting here right now. Okay? You've got to be able to inhibit those impulses in order for us to function in our world. Another is the ability to initiate. So that is being able to get started. Uh, sometimes when we're evaluating children and we give them a task, we say go, and they sit there, which is kind of odd. Usually when we say go, people go and do things. But some, sometimes when kids have executive dysfunction, they have a hard time initiating behavior. So in the classroom, that can look like, for example, a child who is uh, being inattentive or not uh, wanting to participate, where in fact they may have some other issues that are going on that are more brain-based. A difficulty in being able to initiate behavior and keep that behavior going. And then we also have this concept called working memory. 
that's, uh, that's a form of memory. It's a very short-term kind of memory. It allows us to keep information in mind just basically long enough to do a task. If you think about before we had our cell phones and just be able to punch in a person's name and the call goes out, we have to look up a number and kind of keep it in mind long enough to punch in that number. That's sort of working memory, being able to keep that information in mind. Uh, a lot of times when we see kids, particularly with uh, attention problems, we're really looking at some of these working memory kinds of issues where they're having a hard time keeping that kind of information going for a short period of time. And certainly all this planning and organizing uh, ability, be able to anticipate uh, what might happen next, being able to anticipate consequences. If I do this, then this is likely to happen, right? Uh, being able to set goals and to work systematically. So as I was putting this together, I was working systematically. I was gathering up information, trying to arrange it in a way that made sense and so forth. And certainly our ability to uh, keep our materials in an orderly manner. Like, why is that an executive skill? Well, we can't find our stuff. We can't really do much of anything. Sound like some of your kids? Sound like you? <laughs> and our ability to monitor your behavior. Another executive, broad executive skill. So it's not enough just to be able to start a behavior and be able to maintain uh, your focus for a while. You have to be able to, to monitor your progress so that you can make adjustments. For example, Jan was acting as my executive system a few moments ago, asking me to stay over here so that uh, I'm in frame for the, uh, for the video and can pick up. So being able to take in information and monitor, be able to monitor what you're doing and what the consequences are, what the results are, so that you can then change your behavior accordingly. Where does this reside in the brain? We got a lovely picture up there. Now, for a long time, we thought about this being uh, executive function as being solely a, a frontal lobe kind of a uh, issue. That you know these executive skills, these kind of abstract skills, lived in our frontal parts of our brains. Actually, the thinking now is more like the frontal lobes are certainly important, but it's all these interconnections with the frontal areas, with all these other areas of the brain. So it's not so much a frontal lobe issue as it is more of a, a frontal system where the frontal lobes and some of the processes that go there are kind of coordinating and um, you know, uh, connecting with all these other brain areas and, and managing all that. So, for example, the frontal system is interconnected with the limbic system. You ever heard of the limbic system? It's my favorite system. It's got some of my favorite brain structures. Uh, limbic system, broadly speaking, because when we talk about the brain and what this area does and this area does, it's always kind of broadly speaking. I think Dr. Dewar, I think, would agree with me about that. Um, but the limbic system is, is uh, really involved in emotion and memory motivation, and actually in development, which we'll talk about in a few moments, the limbic system develops a lot more rapidly than the frontal system. So think about that for a minute with your teenagers and sometimes the behavior that you might see with them. Uh, there's also a lot of interconnection with the reticular activating system. This is all about arousal. This is what kind of perks us up and keeps us going, so to speak, helps us maintain our attention, our alertness. And then, of course, all these posterior parts of the brain, uh, which deal with different types of perception and other cognitive processes, and then these motor regions in the front part of the brain that kind of border uh, the frontal lobes and some of the other areas. So there's all these interconnections. And one of the things I've noticed in my, my practice as we evaluate children with different types of neurological uh, issues is that it almost seems like anywhere uh, or anytime we have a child, regardless of what the issue is or where that lesion might be or what that, that specific brain area might be affected, it almost always hits the executive system. You know, some aspect of that. And attention, too. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And it gets all to this interconnectivity, this 
back and forth transmission of information from the frontal lobes and all these other brain areas. So really, in a sense, and this is a, certainly an overgeneralization, the, the frontal system is really the boss of the brain. It helps deal with all this integration of information. It has a lot of uh, dealings in terms of inhibitory control and all sorts of things, you know. So when we're talking about uh, all these different areas of the brain, it's the frontal lobes that help us integrate. So that's really one of the key areas right there. And all those different little sub-skills sub that I talked about really gets into this ability of our brains to integrate information, process information, engage in these higher order processes in terms of thinking about the future, being goal directed and all the rest. <coughs> now I mentioned uh, the developmental course of executive functions as a group of skills, these are pretty slow developing. Now the development occurs throughout uh, the lifespan of the child and certainly infants are developing executive skills. We see this as they as you observe your, your babies uh, with their gaze and being able to maintain focus and uh, start engaging in some basic problem solving, all those sorts of things. But there's a very prolonged course in development. Sorry, I had to do my Marco Rubio impersonation. So, um, so there's this prolonged course of development. What we're understanding more and more is that the executive skills really uh, continued to develop well into our early 30s. There was a thought that maybe early to mid 20s, but there's been some research more recently that suggests that these kinds of skills are actually developing even into our 30s. Now, um, sometimes when we have uh, folks with uh, early acquired uh, brain injuries of different type. For example, a child who might have experienced some sort of a um, uh, traumatic brain injury. Because the executive system develops so much slower, slowly than the other systems, you may not see some of the problems until a little bit later on when those systems are supposed to come online. That kind of thing. Um, but if you think about the, uh, the frontal system, the executive system, as being this, this manager, helping us learn how to manage our world, manage our emotions, help us engage in all these abstract processes, but it's one of the later things that come on, you might notice some behavior in your children. For example, teenagers. I mentioned earlier that the limbic system, which is associated with emotional control and how we respond to things emotionally, tends to develop a little bit earlier, a little bit faster. But the, the frontal system, which helps manage all those emotions, don't come on quite so quickly. So you think about your teenagers who, you know, the small things, and what do they do? Oh my gosh, it's the end of the world. You know, small problems are big problems, that moodiness and all that kind of thing. That's part of the reason. It's neuroanatomical. Of course, as they get older and those systems come online, all that behavior starts to, uh, starts to moderate. So by the time they're 17 or so, they get to be human beings, right? They're able to come manage that behavior. A lot of times with adolescents in particular, you know, they got the skills, the cognitive skills. Their intellect is not that much different than an adult. But they don't have fully the... Uh, the abstract reasoning, the, the ability to think about the future, think about the consequences. If I do this and this is likely to happen, that's not quite as well developed. So even though they may be our equals in the case of my kids, my superior in terms of intellect, they don't have the experience or those executive skills that would help them utilize their intellect to full ability. So thinking, and Dr. Dewar is going to talk more about uh, Tourette's, but thinking about executive systems and Tourette's, the research that I read, it really uh, indicates sort of a mixed bag. Uh, typically, it seems that Tourette's by itself 
would certainly put a person at higher risk for some executive issues, particularly in the areas of planning, um, some of that more higher order abstract reasoning, uh, that sort of thing. What seems to be uh, evident in most cases is that Tourette syndrome plus things like attention deficit hyperactivity <coughs> disorder and or obsessive compulsive disorder, the presence of, of, of one, or, one or both of those with Tourette's seems to be where most folks have a lot more difficulty in terms of executive uh, deficits. There have been some studies which would indicate that, uh, you know, in general, kids with TS uh, compared to others in terms of standardized measures actually look pretty similar to the regular population. So my take home message from all this, and again, this is a very broad, quick overview of executive skills. You know, everybody's different. If you have a child with Tourette synd uh, syndrome um, and you notice that they're having some difficulties, well, they may be at risk for some executive problems, so particularly with that problem solving, planning uh, areas. Um, again, they're at much higher risk, uh, it seems, if there are other comorbid conditions, such as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or obsessive compulsive disorder. And of course, that's a real problem because a lot of kids with Tourette syndrome also have ADHD. It's a pretty high comorbidity. If you feel that your child has any kind of executive deficits, has trouble with organization and planning, has trouble with being able to sustain attention and some of the other issues that we talked about, a good neuropsychological evaluation can be helpful. That type of evaluation um, can let you know as best we can uh, what your child's strengths are and where they may have some uh, areas of weakness in terms of executive skills as well as other uh, cognitive processes. And certainly that type of information can be helpful just in terms of how you can best help your child, but certainly can help you advocate for uh, educational services. Psychotherapy can be helpful. Uh, you're not going to talk somebody into having good executive functions. So that's part of brain development. But certainly helping that your child uh, cope with some of the difficulties that they might experience because of their Tourette's or some of the other comorbid conditions that go along with that. Stress management, for example, can be very helpful for individuals with Tourette syndrome. Stress seems to increase some of the ticking and that sort of thing. And certainly, psychotherapy can be helpful in terms of helping your child learn some of those skills uh, in how to cope and deal with some of the emotional fallout from having something like Tourette's. Uh, for example, learning how to deal with any kind of social isolation or stigma, um, any kind of self-esteem issues that might arise, that sort of thing. And certainly, as good psychotherapists can help you advocate for the school, with the school. I believe we're going to save questions to the end, so I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Doyle.